kitchen. <laughs> the, uh, so today we're going to be making what, Karen? It's a chocolate biscuit cake, um, which is a family favorite recipe of mine, but it's also became a great favorite when I was cooking for Prince Charles, Princess Diana, Prince William and Prince Harry. And when the boys were young, it was a real um, tea time, afternoon tea favorite of theirs. Brilliant. And the, the good thing about this is you can kind of, from my understanding, you can kind of transform the recipe to to make it for a lot of different seasons, different spices, different ingredients, you can kind of mix and match a little bit, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the easiest recipe. Um, no baking involved. It's just uh, melting and then mixing. So you can vary the ingredients. And as we go through and add all the different ingredients, I'll talk you through all the different variations you can make. Perfect. So uh, if, if you have me fixing it, it should be, it has to be easy because I am not a professional like yourself. So uh, what do we need to do to get started? Let's start with the butter. Um, so we need uh, 12 ounces of butter or three sticks of butter. And I've got some here that I weighed out earlier. So put that into a, a nice big pan that you can put on the stove. Um, we're going to add the other ingredients in afterwards, so leave yourself plenty of space. So first the butter, and you can either use salted butter or sweet unsalted butter. It doesn't really matter. I've got some unsalted butter today. Uh, that's, that's what I'm using as well. So this, this is uh, quite a bit of butter. Uh, it is. It is. Uh, melt at the end. That just makes it, uh, makes it really healthy for us, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good farm butter. There's nothing better. Um, the next ingredient we're going to add in is golden syrup, which is really easy for me to get here in England, but I know it's a lot less, uh, lot less readily available in the states. Um, so you can easily substitute honey or maple syrup. Um, so I've measured mine out here, and a really good little trick when you're weighing something like this out, so that it doesn't all stick to the container. Um, just put a little drop of vegetable oil in or, or mild olive oil and rub it all around. And then when we come to pour it out, it just slips out and doesn't stay behind on the container. And we can mix this in before the butter is fully melted? Yep, absolutely. So just pop those both in the pan. And now we're going to heat these up so the butter melts and it mixes together. I'm just going to pop to the stove, which is behind me. So, when did you first learn about this recipe? This is something that uh, my mum used to make for me when I was a child. Um, and it's one of those recipes that I think a lot of families, they have their own version of it. Um, so there's lots of different variations, but it's always the same method. It's always melting some butter, mixing in golden syrup or honey, um, and then adding some chocolate, and then finally um, adding in some crumbled up cookies. So really, really easy. And it's always a great thing for children to get involved in as well. And William and Harry always loved coming in and crunching up all the, all the cookies to go into the, into the chocolate biscuit cake. So it's really a good recipe to kind of just for the family to spend some time together in the kitchen. Like. It, it is, yeah. There's a there's a job for every member of the family, um, and as I say, it's also really good because you can um, vary the ingredient ingredients according to what your family tastes are. So if you're doing an adult one, I would tend to do really dark chocolate, um, possibly some ginger biscuits, and then add a bit of stem ginger. You could add a tiny little bit of paprika, so it has quite a bite to it. Um, if you wanted to do a festive version, um, then I quite often put some dried cherries that I've soaked in brandy. That's a really good warming Christmas version. So there's lots of different ways you can make it. How's your butter, Art? Has it melted? It's uh, not quite almost. Uh, we're getting there. I'm just kind of keeping it stirred so that the honey doesn't uh, settle to the bottom and burn. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. You've got to, um, about the only thing that can go wrong with this is when you're melting the ingredients together is that honey does burn incredibly easy. So don't let the pan get too hot. So for the folks watching, 
Uh, I mean, let us know what kind of recipes your family had that would be similar to this. Um, well, I grew up in South Africa, so the, the version of this that we used was slightly different in that we used different biscuits in it. Um, and it was always made with milk chocolate. Um, but a, a sort of along similar lines, another thing we have in England is flapjacks. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that art. Yeah. It's, um, also, basically butter melted together with some golden syrup or some honey. And that has a lot of oats mixed in. So oats, and then you can add all kinds of nuts and seeds and dried fruit or chocolate chips. Um, and again, just a, a recipe that every family seems to have their own special favorite version of it. Um, mine's all melted now. Mine so, as well. I'm going to add in now the um, 100 grams or, as you would say, four ounces of chocolate. I've got some quite dark chocolate here. So I'm just going to pop that in um, and also some unsweetened cocoa powder, um, two ounces. I weighed mine out earlier. So put that into the pan as well. And Sit then get over the heat. Mix it round really well so that the chocolate melts. The other good thing about this is you can do it in um, so many different shapes. Um, you can do it as a tray bake, or you can do it in a, a loaf shaped tin and cut nice slices. Um, or you can do it in a normal round cake tin, which is what I'm going to do today. And with Christmas coming up, something that um, is quite fun to do is mold it into the shape like a long salami. Um, and it makes a really lovely gift actually. So a long, a long salami shape, and then people wrap it up like a Christmas cracker, and people oh, enjoy that. A nice little, uh, little extra treat for folks during the holidays. It uh, is. It's, it's good. It's um, nice. This is quite rich, so you don't need very large slices of it. And if you do it like that, it's the perfect size slice, I find. Mine's looking quite nice and. Uh, like a really rich, glossy, thick chocolate sauce now. How's yours coming on, Art? Uh, I would say the same. Yeah, very, very much like a chocolate sauce. Excellent. I'll just get the last of my chocolate melted. This um, was a great favorite when Prince William and Prince Harry were going back to boarding school. Um, they were allowed to take with them what's called a tuck box. I think you said it's a care package there? Yeah. Um, and this was always a this was always their first choice to go in their tuck box for boarding school. So the, uh, Carolyn, uh, at what point do I take it off of the heat? You can take it off, yeah. As now, if the residual heat will melt the last of the chocolate. Mine's off the heat now. Okay, same here. And was I supposed to put the vanilla in yet? Yep, you can put the vanilla in now. Um, I'm going to put mine in. Another option that's um, nice is uh, you can do a, a mint version of this, a peppermint. So I've got, just so I remember to tell you, my bottle of little peppermint oil here. Um, chocolate and peppermint oil makes, again, it's a lovely festive version of this. So I've got some nice vanilla bean paste. And I'm just putting a teaspoon of that in. So if you were changing the spice up, right now would be the time where you would maybe like a pumpkin spice or something something else right now would be the time you put that flavor in it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Heading towards, uh, I guess you could make a Halloween version of it with some spooky eyes on the top or something. <laughs> and as you say, some lovely, lovely warming spices. I'm also going to add in now, um, the recipe says pistachios and figs. But again, this is really interchangeable. If you don't like nuts, you can leave those out altogether. You can use toasted almonds or you could use um, pecans, um, just whatever nuts you like. Walnuts are good too. Um, and actually today for a change, instead of nuts, I decided to do a nut free version. I've got some little cocoa nibs here, um, which are just like the texture of a nut. They add that extra little bit of crunch. Um, but these are nice because they're quite bitter and it is quite rich. So they add a crunch and a nice little bitter um, top note to the chocolate biscuit cake. So I'm going to put that in. Um, I'm even on my side. Uh, I'm 
I'm not using nuts because I personally have an allergy to them. Uh, but we will have the uh, figs in here. And then, yep, some chop the figs up really finely. Um, the other option, which I've got pre-chopped in here, um, but the other option is, of course, or oh, you could use dried apricots, um, raisins or sultanas. Um, some people like brandy sick prunes. Um, just really whatever your personal preference is. Cherries are really good as well. So that should mix in fairly easily. And then the last job left to do is to crumble in the cookies. I've got some um, digestive biscuits which are a very traditional English English cooking biscuit. Um, but I'm guessing you're using something like graham crackers. Yes, and I, Carolyn, I will admit, I cheated a little bit and I broke them up beforehand. Oh, you're very sensible. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you can I'll put them all those in here now, right? Yep, that's perfect. So you just tip them all in. I'm just going to crumble them in as I go. I think it's quite nice to have them quite chunky. Um, but if you want to, you can put them in the food processor so you have really quite fine crumbs. Either way, it doesn't really matter. That's a brilliant idea. Yeah, I could have saved a little bit of time, but I didn't <laughs> think about that. Um, so, Carol, how do you th uh, what would be the um, most famous time this particular cake has been used? Um, well, the most famous time is certainly um, Prince William's wedding in the, the months preceding the wedding. Um, I was really excited one day when I read in the newspaper that that's what he had chosen to have for his groom's cake, and he wanted to have this chocolate biscuit cake. Um, and it was exciting for me knowing that I'd made it for him when he was still a very little boy and made it for him to take that to boarding school. Um, so I didn't make the wedding cake. That was made and gifted to him by the company that makes the digestive biscuits, MacBitties. Um, but yes, and and uh, over the years I made many a chocolate biscuit cake birthday cake for for the boys when they were growing up um, and I believe this is something that even um, the queen will quite often have for tea if she has guests there so it's, it's quite a royal recipe so Carol we haven't really talked about your backstory do you want to just give a little brief overview of your uh your history with the royal family yeah of course yeah um i well i'll go back to the beginning um grew up in south africa and at the end of um, university i came over to europe and had a wonderful spell in a swiss hotel then i came to england and did a cordon bleu cookery course um and at the end of that time i was offered a position in the royal household at kensington palace and my first job was as chef to the duke and duchess of gloucester and the Duke of Gloucester is one of the Queen's cousins. So they're one of the sort of lesser known members of the royal family. Um, but it was an absolutely brilliant introduction to life as a royal chef, um, life in the royal household. Um, so I moved into Kensington Palace when I was 21 and, and started cooking for the family. Uh, they had three young children. So for me, it was lovely. It was a real, um, I've always loved cooking for children. Um, and just a really lovely, as I say, sort of family cooking job. Um, but Kensington Palace is quite a large complex, if I can call it that. And at that time, there were lots of members of the royal family living there. We were immediately next door to Princess Margaret, who's the Queen, was the Queen's sister. Um, and then in the largest apartment was Prince Charles, Princess Diana, and William and Harry, who were quite young at that point. Um, and I was really fortunate because they were invited for dinner one night with the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester. And then shortly after that, I was um, invited to go and have an interview with Prince Charles because at that time he was looking for a female chef. He'd always had male chefs. Um, so I was incredibly fortunate. I was really in the right place at the right time. And uh, William and Harry were just four and seven when I joined and 15 and 18 when I left. So it was a real privilege to be with them during all their formative years. So you really got to experience them growing up. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And it was, yes, it was, it was really lovely to be around them. And it was a very, very varied job. We traveled a lot, um, had some time in London, um, 
quite a lot of time at Highgrove, which is their country home in the Cotswolds. A um, couple of trips to Scotland a year, a couple of trips to East Anglia, and then there were some overseas official state visits as well. So one thing I did get really good at while I was there is packing and moving. <laughs> states that we see a lot uh, regarding the royal family. I mean, we've all watched uh, Downton Abbey or The Crown and shows like that. And just a typical dinner uh, for the family, would that be as lavish as what we see on TV or would that be much simpler in, in reality? No, much simpler. Um, for the most part, it would be still be seated formally around the dining room table. Um, and the meal would be served by a butler, um, but certainly a lot less low key. And if it was the summer, then if at all possible, they would have it outside in the garden. Um, and the meal and the food was simple. The food, I described the food that I used to make as the very best of simple home cooking. Um, all the menus were planned around what was in season in the garden at the time. And there was the most fabulous organic um, fruit and vegetable garden at Highgrove. Um, so as a young chef, it was an absolute dream to not not pick up the phone to order my fruit and vegetables, but walk down the garden and, and talk to the gardener and come back with this amazing basket of freshly picked vegetables. Um, and yeah, as a, long, as a young chef, I also learned a lot about seasonality, obviously cooking with the seasons because we used what was in the garden. Um, and Prince Charles was very much a forerunner in terms of understanding about sustainability and traceability and obviously organically produced food um, and the provenance of, of all the ingredients we used were very important to him so um, that's something I've always carried with me and always so grateful to have learned that when I was still such a young chef. So. Mine's nearly mixed now, how's yours doing? Well I think um, I think we're there. All the bits are covered. There's still some chunks in there because, like you said, they left uh, some uh, a little bigger than, than others. Just to get that nice little crunch when you're when you're yeah. eating. Uh, yeah. But I think, uh, yeah, I think we're there. Yeah. So and, I'm good. I've just um, I've lined my mold with a bit of plastic um, saran wrap. I think you call it plastic wrap. Um, but you. Know, tin foil or you could use a silicon, um, reusable silicon sheet. And as I say, it can either be an over tin or it could be a round one or um, just whatever um, you have in your- I've done the same with uh, cling wrap, saran wrap, whatever brand that folks have with the plastic wrap. I've done the same. Yep, yep, that sounds perfect. And I'm just gonna get a spoon and then I can spoon that in. Um, it's, as you as you put it in, it's quite important to press it down really well so you don't get sort of holes up the sides of it. So a couple of spoons, and then I'm just going to press it down really well. So with uh, as we're doing this, with some of the other things that you could put in there to maybe, uh, I mean, some folks like coffee or or things like that. I assume you could use ingredients like that as well, no? Absolutely. Yep. Um, so many different flavorings. As I said, you can do vanilla, you could do um, ginger is really good. So you use ginger biscuits and then um, some grated stem ginger. Um, you can just do a really rich dark chocolate and a little bit of grated um, orange zest. That's really nice. And then you can use some dried um, candied citrus peel in it. Um, if you wanted to do a, a dark cherry one, that's quite nice. Sometimes I use um, shortbread biscuits with that and then some spice as well some cinnamon some brandy soaked cherries um, as you mentioned coffee um, that's really nice as well you can just um, mix a bit of uh, coffee essence is what i would use coffee extract in with the chocolate um, and that's really nice with uh, macadamia nuts i find now with the fruits would, would folks use uh, candied fruits or just dried fruits you can use either. Um, I tend to use sort of dried fruits if I'm just doing a, a regular everyday one. But if it's a Christmas time one, um, candy fruits are really special. And that, that works really well. Um, and the biscuits, you can use graham crackers, you can use ginger biscuits, shortbread biscuits. Um, if you want to make it really chocolatey, you can use a, even something more like a chocolate chip cookie. 
It is uh, having tasted this before. I, I can uh, say it is already with this recipe as it is. It is very very chocolate. Uh, it, is, it, it is exceptionally rich. It is. You, you really don't need um, a big slice of it. So although the cake itself isn't that big, um, as you've said, Art, you don't need very much to satisfy you. <laughs> Once we've um, pressed this into the tin, we just um, put it in the refrigerator or leave it, leave it to cool down a little before it goes in the fridge, but then um, cover it up and chill it for a couple of hours and it should be really well set after that time. So we, we want to set, leave it setting uh, out for a little bit to let it settle before we put it in the fridge. Is that what you said? I just leave it to cool a little bit. Yeah, I never like to put, I mean, mine's quite cool already, um, but I never like to put anything in the refrigerator that's a little bit warm. Um, so just leave it standing on the side for half an hour or so before you put it in. And with the top, you can either um, pat it down really hard and get a very smooth top, or alternatively, you can leave it quite nice and rustic, which I think is quite fun. So have some bits sticking up. Um, and then that makes it more interesting when you come to decorate it. Yeah, it almost looks, here in the States, we have a, a candy bar called Crackle. Uh, so it's like a chocolate rice crispy uh, cookie type of a candy bar. And it kind of looks like that. It doesn't taste like that, but it does look like that. Um, okay. Make yeah, no, it's a good. Um, you can, I guess, make a slightly healthier recipe. You could put some seeds in, some, um, something like pumpkin seeds and pine kernels, um, sunflower seeds, and lots and lots of fruit. Um, occasionally, I do put things like rice pops in just to make a change. Fewer, fewer cookies and a few more rice pops. I find that works well too. I mean, we, we, we don't want to pollute the chocolate too much. I mean, it's, it's really about the chocolate, right? That's right. Yeah. So, the, uh, so this sets out uh, for a little bit, and uh, then we'll put it in the refrigerator. And then uh, once it's cold and chilled in the refrigerator, uh, I, I assume there's some other decorating options and things like that. Or you can just leave it as it is, right? That's absolutely right. I've got one here that I made a little earlier. So this one I've set and I've turned it off. Um, so, as I was saying, it's got quite a that you have here. This is already chilled, uh, that you've had in the refrigerator for a couple hours. Yeah, this has been in the fridge for a while. So this one is, um, if you look at the top, it's quite, um, rough and quite rustic. So we have two options for decorating either that way, or we can turn it upside down and we've got a really smooth finish to it. Um, it's your choice entirely. So I'm just going to melt a little bit of chocolate and drizzle it over the top just to give you the, uh, show you what it'll look like. I'll just get some of my chocolate down and quickly melt this. Um, it's a really good thing to use for a, um, I've made a few, few wedding cakes, as I say, but it's a really good birthday cake option as well. Um, particularly if you're traveling anywhere, because it's really hardy and it doesn't get damaged easily. Okay. I've uh, a few times if I've been traveling abroad to go and see my brothers or something I've got brothers in Australia New Zealand and South Africa this is always a really good thing to take with me because um, I know it's not going to get damaged on the way I'm just going to melt some chocolate so, and then for decorating it you can either drizzle it with white chocolate uh, cover it with dark chocolate white chocolate drizzles um, or just stick some malt balls on the top, some little white chocolate stars. Um, I just like to have fun with it, really. Um, I think for today, I'm going to go with the rustic look. So I'm going to turn it that way up um, and just get a few little things to put on the top. So Carolyn, with, uh, with something like this, as simple as it is, um, would, would say, we were talking about the royal family, would say members of the royal family still have something like this to they snack on semi-regularly? Um, yes, they would. Yeah, they would have it at tea time. The, the royal family are very, very disciplined in the way that they eat. Um, 
So snacking wasn't something they did very much of, but it's certainly something that would be um, there to be served at an afternoon tea if there were guests, um, or perhaps if they were going up to Scotland and they were going up for a day's shoot or something like that, then I would... Or the sandwich, um, along those lines, yeah. Now, it's another great favorite. Um, Prince Charles actually isn't a great fan of chocolate, um, and his afternoon tea treat was always just to have a tiny little piece of um, fruitcake with his cup of tea, um, as this wasn't something he ever ate himself. Um, but he did like to serve it to his guests. There we go, this is melted now. So, just give it a quick stir. So is that your, this is just pure chocolate that you're putting on top of it? Yeah, this is just some um, chocolate that I've, dark chocolate that I've melted. And so Karen, as you're doing that, if, if folks like this recipe and they want to find some more recipes that you have uh, in your arsenal, is there um, a place that they can go get cookbooks or something that you have? Yep, I do have a, a cookbook called um, The Royal Touch, and this recipe is um, one of the recipes in there. Um, there's my book. Um, and yeah, it's available on Amazon still at the moment, so hopefully it'll stay there for a while. But it's a book that has a hundred of my favorite recipes, so um, really from all different times during my life, some of them from when I was growing up, um, a lot of them from during my time in the royal household. Um, and some that I've just picked up over during my travels. Um, like you, Art, I really love traveling and I've moved around quite a bit. Um, having grown up in South Africa, spent some time in California, um, had a few years in the Middle East as well. So um, some interesting things that I've picked up along the way. And just to re reiterate, the name of the cookbook is uh, it, Aurora Touch. Yeah. yeah. It's the, the Royal Touch, that's correct. Royal Touch by Carolyn Rahm, and the, her last name uh, is the R-O-B-B. So uh, if you're a fan of this recipe, you want to see some more uh, variety, uh, please go out and uh, secure your cookbook and have yourself a, a royal royal dinner. Right, we're nearly done enough. Can I just get one more little decoration? Um, because it's so rich anyway, I don't think it needs to be completely covered in chocolate. So what I tend to do is just literally drizzle chocolate over the top like this, back and forth. I've got it dripping off a, a palette knife. Um, otherwise I find it's just too rich it's, if you've got chocolate on chocolate. So I've just got some drizzles over the top. And then I've got a few, um, we call them Maltesers. I think you call them malt balls. It's yeah. just tiny chocolate ball with some honeycomb in the middle. I like to put a, a few of those on the top. Um, just to give it a bit of extra height and texture. Um, and then I, as I was watching you do that, I'm thinking even after you slice it, if you didn't want to use the chocolate drizzle, you could use like a fruit drizzle or something on each slice. I don't think you'd probably want to put that on the whole cake because I'm not sure how well that would keep versus just the chocolate. But on an individual slice, I, I assume that would work. Absolutely, yep, that's a really good idea to, yeah, and sort of serve it with some fresh berries or something um, is a really good idea. It does help to offset some of the, some of the richness of all the, the chocolate and the fruit and the nuts. Um, so I'm now just putting a few little tiny white chocolate stars on on the top and then I usually finish with one more little frizzle of chocolate going in the other direction like that and then I will um, try and bring it a bit closer to the to the camera so you can see what the top looks like so brilliant that's yeah. the finish yeah it looks lovely uh, that one is uh, much much better looking than my version <laughs> I'm sure yours tastes great, Art. <laughs> the, uh, so in a nutshell, that's how easy it is to um, make this particular t cake. And 
The official name, once again, Carolyn, is, is what? Chocolate biscuit cake. Um, some people call it fridge cake, as in refrigerator cake, because it's um, not baked but leave, left to set in the refrigerator. But yeah, chocolate biscuit cake is what I what I usually call it. Um, and as you say, it couldn't be easier because you can really just um, open your kitchen grocery cupboard and see what's in there and and put whatever you feel inspired to put in. If you're doing a children's version, sometimes my little girls like marshmallows in it. Um, or little chopped up candy bars, Mars bars, Snickers, things like that. And you don't have to decorate it. As we've said, it's so rich anyway. You don't have to add more, more chocolate on top. So really, really easy. If, uh, if I can make it, anyone watching can for sure. So um, I, I am as, uh, as least prepared in the kitchen as anyone on, on the live stream, I would imagine. Uh, but I, uh, I've done it with your guidance and it turned out quite well. It just needs to settle and then chill and we'll have a slice of it a little later uh, this evening. Um, Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us today on, uh, and teaching us something, uh, letting us learn a little bit about the, uh, the royal family. And if folks uh, want to check your cookbook out. It's called The Royal Touch. You can find it on Amazon, uh, The Royal Touch uh, by Carolyn Robb. And uh, Carolyn, any, any parting uh, advice or, or stories for, for the group watching? <laughs> um, my, I guess my advice as far as cooking goes is always just um, keep it simple because I think the best things are always the, the simplest things, some lovely fresh ingredients simply prepared um, and that's certainly the sort of the mantra that Prince Charles always lived by. He loved things that were fresh and, and straight from the garden. Um, and when William and Harry were young, they loved to um, go down to the garden and pick some berries and then bring them into the kitchen. And together we would make some strawberry ice cream, something like that. Um, so they were both quite accomplished cooks, even when they were quite little. Um, but... Yeah, it's definitely the time of year for that with harvest season. So much, uh, uh, a lot of different ingredients being harvested fresh right now uh, as the seeds. As the yeah, farmers. it's all the lovely autumn fruits, all the apples and blackberries. And yeah, it's a, I think it's a lovely time of year. I love the summer, but the autumn has even nicer fruit and vegetables, I think. Indeed. Well, Carolyn, thanks so much for joining. Uh, we appreciate you uh, spending time with Tannen today. And um, folks, if you want to learn how to cook, uh, as Carolyn presented, go check her cookbook out. Uh, we can also, on your vac vacations in England, we can also make arrangements um, with, with Carolyn for you individually. Uh, so uh, we appreciate you watching. Carolyn, we thank you for your, your advice and for if you can teach me to cook, you're, you're doing well. So uh, thank you so much for that. We, we're privileged to have you with us today. It's an absolute pleasure. I've loved cooking with you, Art. We must do it again one day. Absolutely. That is a plan. All right. Thanks all. Have a good afternoon. And you. Take care. Bye-bye.